everyone, I'm Larissa Russell of Creative You, and I'm your host of the Creative Soul Healing Podcast. Here's where we talk about the connection between creativity and healing by interviewing amazing creatives, spectacular healers, and inspiring people who have used creativity in their healing. What does it mean to be creative? What is creativity? You don't have to write a best-selling book or paint a masterpiece or even play in a rock band. Creativity is in everything that we do, in the ways we think, in the way we run a business, in our everyday lives, we are creative all the time. Let's talk about how we are creative and how creativity helps us heal mentally, physically, and emotionally, right now on the Creative Soul Healing Podcast. So I'm speaking to Shay today, and she is an artist and world builder focusing on fantasy cartography. She's fascinated by the world building process, the research and description process that goes into developing characters and settings, the visual process of making maps and illustrations, and the conversations that happen between world builders that spur us all on to the richer ideas are all very appealing to her. She thinks that all people are creative and sees creative confidence come out of the most strongly in world builders who get to put down the constraints of reality and ask, what if? So can you share a little bit of your story and your path and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was one of those arty kids that always had a pencil. Um, I started carrying a sketchbook probably when I was seven. I still have the first sketches I ever drew in public. Uh, They're marked from 93 at the Royal Tyrell Museum. Um, I was famous in high school for drawing on the legs of my pants during mass, that kind of thing. I was always that kid. Uh, So much so that I actually needed a carpal tunnel surgery release by the age of 14 and then needed another one at 16 um, because I had done that much damage. Um, That was the single biggest challenge for me being an artist because I had had this injury and was told at 16, you will need to give up drawing because if you keep doing that, it's going to wreck you permanently and you are never going to be able to have a normal life, never mind an artistic life. And so for a long time, I did my best to not draw, um, which was a very bankrupting uh, process for me, emotionally and mentally. Um, And years later, discovered a chiropractor who thought, you know what, part of your problem is not the nerves, part of this is an injury that you have to your neck. She did x-rays, she was right, and was able to fix it with a very gentle correction, which blew my mind and gave me back my hands. So during that whole period of time, I'd never really walked away from art, but I interacted with it differently. I researched things. I enjoyed other people's arts. I lifted up other people in the artistic community. And I really focused on things that I could do with the hands that I had. So I would write using things like Dragon Naturally Speaking. Um, I would do other kinds of artwork that weren't fine motor like larger kinds of painting and stuff like that and just found a way to keep having a creative process regardless and that's kind of just carried me through it got me through undergrad it got me through grad school it's found me in the middle of nowhere alberta (laughs) waiting for everything else to change with the next military posting so it's been the one constant in a lifetime of change Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i've seen over the years the that I've known you, the um, progression that I've seen, right? Like I didn't know you when you were in in high school, but just the progression and maybe it was from after your injury to, to more recently now. And yeah, it's gotten much more detailed and and that sort of thing. But yeah. yeah. And like I said, your maps are just, who knew they could be such works of art, right? So that's amazing. So what does healing with creativity mean to you? I think when I hear that phrase, the first thing I think of is Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. Um, That process of learning to listen to yourself and to actually identify who you are underneath the social trappings of conformity is absolutely the key of healing and art for me. Um, My artistic process has done a lot to help me uh, come to understand and come to grips with my queerness my identity as a person who doesn't believe in certain societal norms such as monogamy, my politics, when I live in a very conservative place, I need to have a place where that can be expressed safely and in the full volume with which I require the expression of it sometimes. I'm a very um, amenable person, I would say. 
And so I don't like to make waves. I don't like to make people uncomfortable, but art has been a way to heal when there is trauma, when there is injustice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need to scream into a sketchbook and then you feel better and you can go back into the world and make a difference. And for me, that's been a really, really key piece of it is figuring out who I am and then using my art to figure out how to make change. Yeah. I love that. I love that phrase, scream into your sketchbook. I love that. That is so true. Like I've never really thought of it that way, but that's exactly what you're doing. Like yep. just have to get it out. You just have to yep. get it out. And I found in recent years, like, especially as I've moved into the map making, my sketchbooks are very personal and I don't post them online. Mm -hmm. um, they are for me now, especially now that I'm doing a lot of public art with the commissions and doing work for game companies and stuff like that. Um, my sketchbooks are mine yeah. and close friends might see them, but like I once had my godparents ask if they could hang on to a couple and just read them through and they, I could pick them up the next time that I came down. And I was like, no, That's even so them, like I love them dearly, but I was like, this is way too much of my heart for you to have. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. And it was, it was a very profound experience for me realizing that there was that much vulnerability attached to these books. Yeah. Yeah, I think especially for, well, for me, sketchbooks, right? Because that's your everyday practice, your everyday letting out emotion and, and your vul vulnerability, absolutely. So well, I, not I, even I, just the really, emotional vulnerability, but like a lot of the stuff in the books is ugly, Yeah, right? It's <laughs> not the curated, true. refined, finished, beautiful stuff that yeah. gets to be on Instagram or on Facebook or whatever. This is where I'm like figuring out how to draw feet and like all of those other things that are the bane of my artistic existence. Yes. So it's, it's that raw, messy side of the practice. And I get touchy about showing that to people because I think we all do as creatives. We fear that criticism. Yeah. I need that safe place. I already get enough of that on the internet with the stuff I think is good enough to share. Like, yeah. <laughs> we're just going to save that all for me. That's so true. So true. Um, so this, you've already touched on this a little bit, but why do you think creativity is important for your own health? Um, I am an artist who was diagnosed bipolar as a teenager, and I didn't really have an understanding of what the illness looked like in the way that it manifested in me. There were people around me who had it, and it looked very, very different for them. Mm -hmm. And so it has been the one thing that's kind of given me that grounding line, that one consistent thing to kind of follow myself through. And as I've understood myself in different ways, it has changed and grown, as you kind of alluded to. Yeah. I went from being, you know, somebody that was like, oh, well, I guess I have to be an artist because all artists are mentally ill, which is a terrible, terrible stereotype. But I think yeah. we've all heard it somewhere yeah. um, to becoming an artist, despite the fact that I have this diagnosis. Um, I am the first person to sit down and go, not all artists are crazy, but I'm also the first person to talk openly about the way that this has impacted my art, the way that my art has impacted it. And the fact that a lot of people, those stereotypes are not useful in the long run. It's a shorthand because it's a convenient shorthand for usually ableist purposes. It doesn't tend to reflect realistically on the people who live with these situations. I'm a pretty big advocate in that way. I'm very honest about this because I think the stigma is old and useless and needs to go. Mm -hmm. And also I think people don't know enough about their own creative processes that stuff like that creates blocks for them. And it shouldn't. You should make art, even if it's bad art, make more of it, just keep doing it. It doesn't matter why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scream into a sketchbook, don't show anybody. Yeah. Just make it. I totally agree. I totally agree. I feel like I wandered away from your question, but I'm sorry. No, no you totally <laughs> answered my question. Um, and what is your favorite creative healing modality? What makes you feel alive, passionate, and whole? Honestly, right now, tabletop role-playing games. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is, Which is not super that, creative, but yeah. Uh, not the one that you're probably looking for, but I got into uh, map making because I started writing a novel. I started writing a novel because I was playing a role playing game with a bunch of people at the table. And there was a story that was happening on the side that I wanted to pay more attention to than what it was going to get at the table. Okay. And so a friend of mine was being posted to Latvia for a year, his character, and my character were involved in this story. And I was like, I'm going to start writing you little short stories 
to kind of keep you in the loop of what's going on with the game while you're gone for this deployment. It turned into 120,000 words. Eventually it will be a book. It might be three. We don't know. But I needed a map in order to track the book. And then that's just kind of built into its own little empire of things. And so right now it's it's the collaborative process of world building with people. Like, And it's so... So mind blowing because you get everything from what does a fork look like in your setting and why to clothing, to holidays, to conceptions of religion, to conceptions of lack of religion, to politics. What does gender look like? What do these expressions have to do with seasonality, if anything? Like, I love that kind of thing. I have a background in anthropology and religious studies. And so the way humans build culture has been a forefront for me academically for my entire academic career. Mm -hmm. And I feel like all of that probably was never intended to go into fictional games and making art, but it has. <laughs> so it's what I'm using it for now. Um, but yeah, the world building has been my favorite thing this last little while, just getting to, to even conceptualize what would our world look like differently. It's almost speculative fiction in a different form. And with the current political climate in different places and various things going on in the world, I could do with some speculation that's not grounded in like dire dystopia. Yeah. So <laughs> that's definitely part of my resistance right now. Yeah, I've never personally thought of these types of games that way, right? Like, I, I, I guess I just didn't understand them. I still don't really. But that's when fair. you explained it like that, it was like, now I want to try. I it's don't want to go do that. Storytelling. Yeah. And I think like when you people get past the idea of like Dungeons and Dragons and the satanic panic of the 80s and all of that stuff, when you look at it as collaborative storytelling of character dramas, that's when you get people going, oh, I want to try that. That actually yeah. sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, and it really, really can be. I have found over my periods of time role playing and world building with people, I make really good quality friends really, really quickly role playing mm -hmm. because you do the same kind of nonsense stuff role playing together that you do in high school when you're figuring yourself out as a person. Mm -hmm. You take crazy risks, you have massive payoffs, there's huge disappointments, and it's this incredible emotional compression into a couple of hours, maybe a couple times a month. And you, you bond over those things the same way that you would uh, over. Hi, Saxon. Sorry, guys, my puppy is here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the phone. You have to Puppy's wait. He's always welcome. <laughs> um, but you bond over that kind of thing and the collaborative aspect of it, the same way that you do bonding over any other kind of collaboration in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I think the vulnerability that goes into playing those games where it can be anything from, I'm going to look like a fool for a second while I try this thing, to I'm going to talk in character about a piece of personal trauma that I've been carrying and see what that brings to this story, um, it can really change from the absurd to the incredibly real. Yeah. And so I have a lot of respect for role-playing games as a storytelling mechanism and as almost in some ways a trauma recovery mechanism. Um, you have to be careful about how you handle the second part of that at a table. People need to be aware that that's what you want to do. They need to consent to being part of that process. Like. It definitely, there's ways of handling it poorly, and I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> um, but I think it is so much more nuanced and um, useful as a tool of creative expression and self-discovery than a lot of people give it credit for. Right. And so that's part of the reason why I've been just immersed in it the last couple of years. It's really become something front and center for me that never was prior to this. Yeah. And it's completely informed my artistic process. I love it. It's well, just, yeah, it absolutely mm -hmm. has, right? Because look at look at where you've gone with it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna have to explore that more. I have to say. I don't know if I can add one more thing at this level, but <laughs> I'm gonna at least explore it. I'll like at least maybe read about it or something. <laughs> yeah. More about it because it sounds absolutely fascinating. So it really can be. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of terrible stuff out there. Um, there's a lot of small format indie games that are coming out that you can play with. There's one coming out, I forget the name of it right now, but I'll look up, look it up and get it to you, that you play by yourself. Oh. It's a guided writing game that's a role-playing game. And you are okay. 
one half of a set of twins and you're writing to yourself. I love um, that idea. And it teaches you about the, like the concept of the game is wonderful. I wish it was not escaping my mind right now. Um, but there are other games that are not Dungeons and Dragons styles um, that involve other kinds of collaborative storytelling that are guided a different way. If you don't like one style of RPG, that just means you don't like that game. Right. You might like it with other people. You might like a different game. You might like a completely different system. It might just be something that you're not feeling that day. I guarantee there is a game out there for everybody. You just need to keep looking for it. It's like eventually you're going to find something you like. You just might not try a few things. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm definitely going to check into it. I love the idea of on your own first. Like, you know, yeah. let's try that first and then yeah. see where that goes. Um, so can you describe the details of your creative process or one of your creative processes? I know you have a few and how it's evolved and what is your favorite medium? Like you've talked about the role playing now, but um my favorite traditional media is definitely pen and ink. Mm -hmm. um, that goes back a long way for me because as a kid, it's what I had access to. I grew up in a town that didn't have an art supply shop. Uh, the next closest one was two hours away. I didn't have a driver's license, like, you know, life. So yeah. I drew up drawing with uh, ballpoint pens, Sharpie markers, the stuff that was ubiquitous that I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. And I honestly credit that, um, restriction to more basic materials to part of my skill now because if you can do good work with crap stuff when you get the good stuff you do real good work because <laughs> it removes some of that barrier right the technical deficiencies of the product um so pen and ink has always been a love for me um, my current work with inktober is a really good example of that um where it's doing the the fiddly stuff uh, i love pointillism i love cross hatching i love lots of intricate black lines mm -hmm. building volume and shape and texture and so for me that's always my my fallback whenever i really need to disappear into a piece of art it is going to be pen and ink it's probably going to be black and white mm -hmm. and i will spend anywhere from four to 40 hours on it before i'm content and mm -hmm. i i don't think that will ever go away like even with doing the maps i'm almost entirely analog even still mm -hmm. uh, they're all pen and ink and watercolor i've recently done one where all of the labels were put on in photoshop and that's the first time i had ever done any kind of digital alteration to one of my pieces like i'm almost unfortunately analog in some ways, I think that given my my struggle with my hands um, and stuff like that, a transition to digital would make a lot of sense to me in terms of lightening the physical load of the art that I want to create. Um, and I'm looking at perhaps making that transition within the next couple of years as I can afford it because the tech is pricey. Yeah. Um, but I don't ever want to lose touch with the linearity of a pen and ink drawing because there is something much more flow state for me about being with just a pen and paper. And also when you can't erase, you trust the process differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a completely different feeling in my head to go pen and paper and go hard. Yeah. And go, this is it. If it's, if it's messed up, it's messed up and you have to either incorporate that and work around it or give it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. I have the ante on myself with my Inktober this year because I'm doing all of the pieces in one sketchbook and I'm doing them one on the front side of the page, one on the back side of the page. So if I mess up the back side of the page on this second drawing, there's no tearing it out of the book. There's no like <laughs> way to make it pretty and maybe erase that problem. Um, and I didn't really think about that at the beginning. That was maybe a mistake on my part. <laughs> but it's forced me to really think about what I'm doing and uh, and get comfortable with the errors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge part of my creative process, too, is just getting comfortable with it doesn't have to be perfect. Perfectionism yeah. is yeah. such a terrible burden. Yes. And that's been something that I have been deliberately trying to work against the last couple of years. The map making has been surprisingly amazing for that for me because I don't have a high emotional investment in it. Okay. Um, whereas when I'm drawing a character, I need to have that certain likeness in order to capture them. There has to be that, that spark, that vitae. 
Um, but a map is primarily just aesthetics. It's not going to break the heart if it's not completely perfect. And there's liberation in that that I didn't know I was missing for like the entirety of my creative journey. I feel very Bob Ross sometimes where it's like, here's a happy little mountain. Oh, great. That hill looks really wonky. We're going to put some trees around it. And it's okay. There's a permissiveness and a, and a looseness that is just wonderful. Yeah. I didn't think I could do something long-term artistically with that kind of ease. And I love that because it's also not draining or taxing. So if I still need to go and do my own art on the side with other stuff, I have that emotional reserve. Right. Um, that's available to me to make the other art that I want to be making. So that's been really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. So when you're creating, are you creating primarily for yourself or for an audience or a customer or? I would say up until about a year ago, primarily for myself. Mm -hmm. um, when I started doing the map making, audience started to become a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had never really gone out of my way to put my work out digitally. Um, the way that I got introduced to the map making was viral. So it was people were instantly interested. There was an audience already. Okay, when are you going to do the next one? When are you going to do the next one? Mm -hmm. um, and now I have a page or I have a Patreon too, but that wasn't the word I was going for. I have an Instagram that is specifically just for work because mm -hmm. I had it as real life and work. And then it just took over. It was constantly the art because the audience was there going, we want to see this, not pictures of your dog. Yeah. And I was like, okay, fine. That's acceptable. And I'm not going to begrudge that. I will just start a separate Instagram because I still have a dog. <laughs> like, yeah. But I still want to see pictures of the dog. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> So now there's a lot more audience. Um, I'm working consistently with commissions. So there's a lot of client work, um, which is a joy. That's something else about the collaboration aspect of this that I really love is bringing other people's worlds to life. Show me what you've got. Let me make this what you're dreaming it could be. Mm -hmm. And like, let me be involved in that. Like as someone who's also a writer, when an author hands me their rough map and says, this is my world, this is what it's about you know, this is how the geography works because there's a magic tree that reaches all the way to the sky and the roots go to the center of the earth. And how are we going to represent, represent that on a flat map? Those are great problems to have. Yeah. And it's really fun to interact with someone else's creativity that way. And I love it in another way because it's also a stewardship role, especially with other artists and other authors where they have this thing that's in their head that's their baby and you get to see the vulnerability of their creative process and you get to help kind of honor that and midwife that into being yeah. and that is cool beyond cool i had never been in that position before uh, in a way that's been so consistent mm -hmm. uh, last year has been almost entirely commission work for me uh, wow. yeah which is unusual but lovely like it, it has just been the coolest thing I hope I can do this forever because it makes me so happy. Yeah. When, yeah. When you can combine, you know, what you love with paying the bills, it is amazing. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I'm paying the bills yet. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to the husband. He is definitely <laughs> covering the bases, but uh, it's really I nice. Feel when up to that. We yeah. need something. I can maybe help out with that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, and what is your inspiration and how has your personal experience influenced your creativity? We talked a little bit about that at the beginning, but. Um, my inspiration is, is the process, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, I know how to make good art because I've been making good art for a long time. I don't always enjoy just making good art because that can be flat or stale at a certain point. You need to do something different to kind of break yourself out of the mold and do something new. Mm -hmm. but the process is always something that I find enlightens me at the risk of sounding super pretentious. Um, try a new material, go take a class, mm -hmm. see something that you really, really like in a book or online or in a gallery and try to duplicate it. You're going to fail, but you're going to learn so much during that process. Um, my mountains on my maps are very iconic um, within the, the small map making community that I'm part of online. 
And they come out of actually a class I took on acrylic painting with an Edmonton artist. Actually, I think she's in Vermilion now, Justina Smith. Okay. She does really cool work with Japanese patterned papers layered into acrylic paint in a yes. collage process. And I don't do the, the layering the way that she does, but I love the, the way the patterns overlay. And so I started kind of taking this idea of what if this wasn't just a shadow? What if this was a textured pattern? And putting that into my drawing and boom, there were these mountains. Mm -hmm. And that kind of innovation gets me really, really excited. That sense of play, that sense of discovery, um, my total diversion here, but my favorite piece of art that I ever made is hanging on my wall above my desk. And it was a piece of cardboard that I painted with blue watercolor and metallic ink. I dumped a bunch of wet coffee grounds on it. I put it in a microwave. I microwaved it till it lit on fire. I pulled it out of the microwave, knocked the coffee grounds out and let it dry. And it created the most beautiful burnt texture. I can't even describe this to you. And I don't know why I did it. Like to this day, I have no clue what spurred me through that process. Mm -hmm. But trusting that something interesting was going to be the result at the end of that process got me this piece of art that like if there was a fire in my house, it's one of the things I would consider going for. Yeah. Because it was such a surprise to me. Yeah. And so the process is a huge part of my own inspiration. Like why not just play with it and see what happens? I'm also hugely inspired by other people's discipline. Um, I don't consider myself a very disciplined person. I am trying to improve upon that. I am prolific, but I would not say I am disciplined. <laughs> um, my friend Myrna is one of the most disciplined creative people I know. Uh, she is constantly making art. She is constantly trying supplies. She is constantly doing everything new. And I love how she organizes herself. She just has a list that's a rolling list. When she's done one thing, she crosses it off and puts it at the bottom of the list and goes to the next thing. And it's just, I want to, I aspire to that. I aspire to that so much. <laughs> one day I am going to have the diligence to stick with a list. It hasn't happened yet, but I have hope. I make lists. Um... Yeah, me too. <laughs> but then you're in a very pretty book and then yeah. I don't look at them again. Um, Bullet journals are a terrible waste on me. Yeah. Um, but like I'm I'm inspired by other people's processes, I guess, mm -hmm. like the discipline and, and what they bring to it, because there's always something for me to learn from someone else. Yeah. Always, always. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's so true. So true. And have you ever felt that your personal expectations have limited your creativity? If so, how have you dealt with this? Oh, for sure. Um I, for a long time, thought that the only art that I could make and be seen as a legitimate artist was photorealism. Mm -hmm. And it had to specifically be like portraits and people and recognizable landscapes and stuff like that. Um, I know where that attitude came from. It was like the art teachers that I had when I was young and who basically said, you're not worth the time that I'm spending on you. Like get out of my class, which was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'd go back and say some choice words to a few of them now. Yeah. Um, but I had to get out of my own way and realize that other people's expectations didn't have to be mine. And I really wasn't able to do that at all well until the last couple of years, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, because I was so careful about not re-injuring my hands, there wasn't really room emotionally for me to say what if I made a different kind of art because any art that I could make at that time was kind of against borrowed time if that makes any sense yeah. you were doing it at the risk of not being able to do something later in your 70s or your 80s because you're messing things up and they won't be able to fix it yeah and so this terrible tension really messed with my ability to envision me making other anything mm -hmm. um everything had to become much more practical, much more utilitarian. I became an excellent cook as a result because I diverted that energy into another creative format that was more utilitarian, but it didn't ever satisfy me quite the same way. Yeah. So expecting that my art had to look a certain way kept me from making it for a long time. Um, now that I've gotten into the map making and the world building, I love, and, and even just the screaming into the sketchbook, I love that 
different levels of completion are now okay in my brain. Mm-hmm. It can be rough, or it can be semi-polished, or it can be completely finished. And all of those things are good. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas before, my previous conceptions would be that they were never good unless they were completely finished. Yes. And that that terrible perfectionism, again, would just kind of ride things. And even when I was done something that I was really proud of, ruin it for me because I would see only the flaws. I think that's a, a problem a lot of artists and, and wannabe artists. Like they yeah. don't consider themselves artists for that very reason, right? Yeah. Yeah. I that's... don't really call myself an artist anymore. Like I, I will, I'll claim the title if somebody uses it for me. Like I think it's hubris not to. I am pretty good at what I do but I like to call myself a creative even more Mm. because I think it's more the action of creating than the action of producing art that defines my process yeah I like that yeah so it's for me it's about making it as opposed to displaying it and I think for me that's the balance for me art is almost a finished past tense thing Mm -hmm. it is the thing that has been made Um, whereas creating is that dynamic verb. So, yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, so we talked a little bit about expectations on yourself and, and then your, your health earlier, were were you ever discouraged and felt that you couldn't continue with your creativity in, in any way? For sure. There were a number of years where between my hands being completely hooped and my brain not being great, Um, I let go of the idea of being a creative person uh, in the art sphere. Um, And there were other things going on at the time that really made me feel like my energy had to be directed towards other things like academic pursuits, being married, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are all worthy endeavors. I am in no way like trashing on those. Um, But they were not satisfying to me in Mm -hmm. the same way. There was definitely a piece of me that was not getting its needs met in that regard. Uh, And it was interesting for me in hindsight to recognize how much me not getting those needs met meant I wasn't able to meet the needs of others. Uh, Julia Cameron talks about filling the well in an artistic sense in her Artist's Way book. And when I couldn't fill the well of my creativity doing the things that I needed to do, I was less able to support other people attempting to fill theirs. And now that I'm in a position to do that again, it's one of the cornerstones of my life. Mm -hmm. Like I just find that it is so much easier for me to get through a day because I see things and I take them in and they become on board in my art in some way. And then I can share that with other people. Uh, Myrna Myrna will say to me, Hey, I want to try this thing. And I'll be like, go do it. Or another friend of mine, will be like, I want to try this embroidery thing. And I'll be like, get on it. And the encouragement is coming from a place of my well being full and my energy being shareable. Mm -hmm. like that void so I think that's a really big thing for me it was really honestly a terrifying thing and I I don't use that word lightly I I do mean it to contemplate who I would be without an artistic practice because it had been such a cornerstone for me for my entire life up to my injury Mm -hmm. and when I went through the period of my separation my divorce my grad school all of that one of the big things was coming back into a sense of my creative self. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very telling that I went to grad school first because academic performance is a great way to get validation for a kind of supervised creativity, mm-hmm. which I really needed at that point. Um, and then immediately after grad school, uh, we moved to the middle of nowhere and there's been nothing for me to do except make art mm-hmm. and learn how to give myself that validation because there isn't anyone else here to do it for me except for the internet. So, it's been yeah. really liberating. <laughs> yeah, because because you really are out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah, <laughs> just about just about the middle of nowhere. But yeah. for a long time, like I didn't know who I was going to be mm-hmm. without this process because it was so integral to how I saw myself as a human being. Yeah, and so to lose it was really alienating. Mm-hmm. Um, I I struggled with that for years, like pushing a decade. And I'm super grateful that Aurora was like, I think I know what's wrong with your hands. I think it's fixable. Like talk about a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I don't, again, I don't use that word lightly either, but it changed everything. I went from being a disability to being able to have my hands back. Yeah. 
pretty amazing. Which is your life, right? It is. It's my whole life. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is amazing. And uh, if you could change one aspect of our society through your work, what would it be? I just want people to make more art. I want them to do it with reckless abandon and mm -hmm. with curiosity and with joy and with patience with themselves and a lot of forgiveness mm -hmm. and just be in that place where the making is more important than the producing. I think that we as a culture have devalued making in favor of consuming. Mm -hmm. And I think that that puts people out of touch with themselves in a pretty profound way. Mm -hmm. And I think making any kind of art bad art, good art, public art, private art, whatever, just making mm -hmm. puts people back in touch with their own sense of agency, which mm -hmm. gives them a feeling of empowerment and control and participation in the world in a way that is not passivity and it is not consumption. Yeah. And I think, again, going back to like current political climate, people need to feel secure and valuable and empowered and one of the best ways that you can do that is to see yourself as a creative person. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I yeah. feel like like you articulate what I've been trying to say, but you just do it so well. <laughs> I'm just like, I stumble over my words and I know what I know, but and then you just come along and just like so eloquently spill it. And I'm like, yeah, what she said. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. So I, yeah, I do. I really want to thank you for for doing this with me. Just thank you for having me. It was really exciting to be asked, and it was really fun to be able to reflect on these things and talk about them. Um, I live stream every week, and so I talk about these things sometimes on the stream, depending on what we're talking about. But it's nice to know that there's a broader platform for these kinds of conversations going on, and that I get to be part of that. Yeah, and I, yeah, my hope, my hope is that people will have a better understanding of creativity and how important it is in everyday life but then also that that healing aspect and and the correlation the whole podcast is about healing um with creativity right so healers and how creativity plays into theirs and then creatives and how healing plays in you know and then people who have also um healed while mm -hmm. using creativity so well i think sort of of interest could be the fact that in, I think in Montreal, there are now doctors who are prescribing art gallery visits mm -hmm. uh, for some mental health complaints that are not serious, uh, serious enough to require like chemical intervention. I should clarify what I mean by yeah. that. Um, but like for some people, this thought is you're also disconnected from what is beautiful. You're also disconnected from the yeah. peace and hush of being in a quiet public space as opposed to a busy one. And mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting thing that we might deal a little bit with disenfranchisement by going back to a gallery. Like, yeah. I, I like that. So that might be an interesting aspect to healing as well as how do you heal in the social, not just in the individual. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very good point. Excellent. Well, thank you very much.